Yesterday I had the chance to interview Zach Voorhees, the Google whistleblower who recently came out of anonymity after having leaked a huge trove of documents uh, detailing the inner workings of Google, probably one of the most powerful corporations in our world today. Now, you would think that any sane uh, journalist would want to interview this guy because he worked there for eight years, he's blown the whistle on some seriously scary stuff that's going on in this enormously powerful company. But you'd be surprised because the uh, first media organization I brought it to uh, declined to uh, air the interview because of this person's viewpoint as dictated by the Daily Beast. These are not actually his views in his words. These are what the Daily Beast says are his views. Now, you would think it would be odd that an alternative media organization who has itself been smeared by the mainstream media smear machine would so readily believe the smears of uh, the Daily Beast, which is not really known for its uh, objective, well-researched, uh, investigative journalism. Although, you know, I mean, there are some good pieces published there. And it's just awfully hypocritical that uh, people will take the words of this group as fact. But then again, that's the problem with Google, and that's the problem with Wikipedia, which works arm in arm with Google, as uh, this interview that I'm about to play will show you. Um, once you get into the, one of their reputational prisons, it's very difficult to get out. Google has nine, ten blacklists. Um, it's, it's like the terrorism watch list. You don't know what you did to get on there, and it will take you a very long time, probably lots of uh, jumping through hoops to get out. And uh, like Wikipedia, once you're labeled fringe, good luck uh, getting anywhere in life. I mean, good luck being taken seriously by a major media organization. Good luck getting your website to, to have high traffic. Good luck getting it to appear in search results, especially getting Google News. I mean, yeah, that's never going to happen, not if you're labeled fringe. And uh, like Wikipedia, Google uses uh, third parties to enact this uh, reputational assassination. Now I'll let Zach explain that better than I can because he's seen it firsthand. But um, I just thought I would read some of his response to this Daily Beast smear piece that was written about him that has for some reason scared away a large portion of the journalists who you'd think would be, would be interested about the inner workings of one of the most powerful companies in our world today. Um, what he had to say was, the weaponization of information is exactly the kind of thing I have sacrificed everything to prevent. I've seen it used to rig elections in the United States and abroad. The information that I've released is unimpeachable, which is why I am being attacked. And this is important because these organizations were perfectly willing to use his documents when he didn't have a name or a face, when he was just an anonymous figure in a sweatshirt in the Project Veritas studio. Um, all of a sudden, once he came out and had opinions and a name and a face and a personal history, he became persona non grata. And I think that's disgusting. And I, I mean, there's really no other way to put that. I think that's disgusting. But, um,. He said, I, as a trained scientist, I have a multifaceted view of the world based on evidence and fact. Therefore, any claim that someone has fringe beliefs or theories should be checked against trends.google.com and see what the views of the rest of America are and what they search for. They may find that many beliefs that are slandered as fringe are actually mainstream beliefs of we the people. This is the problem with Google. This is the problem with Wikipedia. This is the problem of so much of this uh, reputational infrastructure that undergirds our reality, is that we take people's words for things. And while that obviously has a limited use, obviously you can't go and visit every corner of the world and see what's going on there. You rely on journalists and reporters and third parties of various kinds to tell you what something is. You can't experience everything for yourself. However, when it comes to a reputational smear, we are far too willing to let these all-powerful organizations just serve up complete slanders, libels, half-truths, exaggerations, and just in inven inventions out of whole cloth as the truth. And we need to have a more critical eye. We are not raised to do this. We are raised not to think critically, but it is very important if we hope to really survive in this world that we develop some critical capacity because otherwise, you know, you get taken advantage of. Um, basically, what he said about the Daily Beast, referring to it as pushing fake news to the American public for years, is that uh, attempts by bad actors with a history of pushing fraudulent conspiracy theories to the American public should reflect instead on the fact that they live in a free society that allows them to do this. And that's one of the problems I have with this attempt to smear people as conspiracy theorists or fringe or whatever. 
Um, and the FBI itself tried to do this a couple weeks ago when it leaked a document uh, claiming that all conspiracy theorists, quote unquote, are secretly domestic extremists waiting to happen and we have to uh, sanitize the internet so they don't read anything too inflammatory. Um, more than two-thirds of the American population believe a quote-unquote conspiracy theory. And I would argue it's more than that now because you've got the, the people who believe conspiracy theories that are actually true and you've got people who believe conspiracy theories like Russiagate which are just like complete nonsense. So when you put those two together I would argue it's probably more like 90 percent but um, yeah. No, uh, a lot of people won't come out and uh, speak their beliefs in these conspiracy theories because they're worried about what their neighbors will think, what their friends will think, even what their family will think. But um, if you ask someone one-on-one -on -one what they believe about a major historical event, you might be surprised what answers you get. And in general, I would say question your own beliefs, question everybody else's beliefs, and certainly question everything you read. And question everything you watch, too, that goes for this video, that goes for the interview you're about to see. And without further ado, I will get out of the way and uh, let you watch that interview. Thank you. Here with Zach Voorhees from Google. Um, are you are still with Google, correct? Or have no, you, uh, I I resigned any, shortly uh, before I uh, came out. Okay, good to know. Good to know. And you were there for eight years, right? Yes, I was. I started off uh, with Google Earth, and then I moved to uh, YouTube for and three you, years. And you fin you finished uh, at YouTube, or you ended up at regular Google at some point, or? Well, no. So I started off with Google, uh, working for the Google Earth Department, um, and I was with them for five and a half years. Um, and then I left Google to start my own company and then came back and worked uh, at their YouTube division for three years. Okay. And what you mo you said you were motivated. I, I was listening to uh, your interview with Project Veritas. You said you were motivated to come forward because of this whole machine learning fairness thing um, was there anything in particular like one uh, specific moment that made you just decide you didn't want to do this anymore or um, yeah so things just started to get really weird directly after Trump won the uh, 2016 election and I noticed that there was a bunch of weirdo psychology papers that started appearing on the network uh, that was publicly available to any you know internal uh, uh, to any employee um, and I, I was like, what's going on here? I thought this company is about self-expression and expressing yourself. And now they're talking about fake news and, you know, boosting authoritative content. And, um, and they really had this emphasis on, on fake news. And it just kept on progressively getting worse. And the point that it got like too much to bear, and I realized that I really needed to do something, was when I caught Google deleting uh, words out of their translation dictionary in order to make Trump tweets sound crazy. You're talking about the Code Fefe thing, right? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, I noticed I was looking through the documents. I mean, you released hundreds of documents and there's some really appalling stuff in there that just in the space of like 2016 to 2017, Google goes from saying, well, we can't really decide what's fake news and what's not to 2017. All of a sudden they're saying we are the authoritative source for what is true and I mean was there some sort of shift in management that made them just decide they were the rightful arbiters of truth or no there was there was no shift in upper management and it was really weird because I remember like an an article you know saying should like Twitter or Google like ban ISIS and they were like we can't apply censorship because that would set a dangerous precedent and yeah and now you say the wrong word. You say like like <clears throat> um, like Mitch McConnell posted a video of somebody giving him a death threat, and Mitch McConnell got banned. And so everything right now seems to be pretty much a clown world. And people have asked me like how you know, how did this happen? Was there a change in management? And there was no change in management. And it's really interesting because like the CEO of YouTube, Susan Wachowski. You know, she was saying these words like self-expression and we, we need to you know, help the user express themselves through our platform to completely doing a 180 and saying, you know, that we need to like start censoring all this stuff. And she didn't say the word censor. She kind of danced around that word, but, you know, prevent fake news from reaching our, 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 our user base. So what are we doing? Um, basically... This sounds easy, but it's really hard to do. We're pushing down the fake news. We're demoting it. 
um, and we are increasing the authoritative news and promoting it. Um, how do we do that? Um, we have a whole system. We came up with trashy news where we have build classifiers, we identify it, we look for salacious, for clickbait, content that isn't, um, that we don't think is, is uh, you know, the authoritative news. It's just kind of encouraging people to look at, but it's not true. Um, we're training, we added these instructions to our um, raters, and we've updated our classifiers, um, and we are working to understand, identify that with machine learning, and then to push that down. And then we're increasing our authoritative news. We're doing that with things like um, a breaking news shelf. Um, we're treating it in the US and France and the UK and more countries coming soon, where we have sources that come from reputable sources. We work with Google News on that um, to define what those reputable sources are. Um, it triggered last week in the London Bridge attacks. Um, it's also gonna trigger on search. When you type in something, you're looking for a news event, you're gonna see um, news there. And you know, the question is, how can these people you know, go from believing one thing and then completely inverting and saying something else? And that's a really interesting question. Yeah, it makes me wonder, like, was is there this social engineering uh, thing that was sort of underlying Google's mission from the beginning? Because you would think, I mean, a bunch of software engineers, they're mostly designed to, to, do, to do programming, and then suddenly they're programming humans instead of software. Like, was that always the goal, or did they just suddenly realize, we have all this power, let's use it for good, or let's use it for what we think is good? Like, was this always the goal, or do you think that this came later when they realized they had all this power? Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, my girlfriend, uh, in like 2011 or 2012, she she was from um, she was from Ukraine and she was Russian, Ukrainian Russian, and um, she told me that Google was going to become a really evil, evil company, and I I fought with her on this. I was like, no, they're not going to be that. Like you don't understand. This is like a great company, and she was 100% right. And the reason why she knew that knew that this was the way it was going to be was because she had experienced all of this and she had experienced like the clown world, you know, firsthand and had fled from it. And so she saw the patterns um, and I didn't because I was naive and I had never experienced something like this before. And so um, this is what happened. You know, they, they, they turned and I think now looking back on it that the goal of you know, social media was to actually control society. And while the people that were running the company and above them had control of the country, they were going to give us our freedoms. But as soon as they lost control, that's when they started to use Google as a control mechanism to try to get that control back. Yeah, because you get the sense that, I mean, they don't want to talk about it openly, but they really, they, they're trying to nudge people's behavior in a certain direction. And I, I found it very interesting. I forget the name of the document, but there was one where they're, where they're talking about profiling people, basically putting them in categories. And they're very adamant about the fact that they don't want any of this saved to a hard drive. That's how sensitive the data is, where, where they're talking about uh, basically putting people in demographic categories. And so, I mean, to what extent is this uh, this algorithmic bias? They're creating the algorithmic bias so that they can save you from the algorithmic bias. I mean, in a sense, it's like the pyromaniac fireman. I mean, did, did, how close were you to this whole um, algorithmic bias, machine learning fairness thing? Like, were you with the teams that were involved in that or did you just see it or? No. So a lot of people assume that I was one of the operators or implementers of this like bias. And I want to clarify that uh, I was not. I worked on the YouTube product that goes on televisions and game consoles. And um, I was, you know, I consider myself a liberal. Some people say that I'm right wing. Um, maybe liberalism is becoming more of a right wing um, ideal. But I saw what was happening and I just started investigating. And that's all I did. And so I wasn't, I, I don't know the people who implemented it and I don't know too deep knowledge of exactly how it works. Uh, my knowledge comes from the same documents that I've disclosed to everyone else. Yeah, one thing I thought would be useful to, would be to have like a glossary for people who don't really either speak programming or speak Google. I mean, Google definitely has a language of its own. Like, have you considered yeah. maybe putting that out? Because some of the some of the documents seemed like they were saying something very sinister, but it's impossible to tell if you don't know. I mean, for example, like what's what's a twiddler? Yeah. So let me explain some of these terms. So 
Uh, under ML Fairness, there's certain sub projects that you know help it you know control and sculpt the information landscape. So Twiddler is one of those um, is one of those subsystems, and it's it 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 manages um, it manages real time events and sees trends that are happening in real time and then tries to you know, amplify or um, dampen them. So for example, let's say that there's an earthquake that happens, um, then they're going to be able to respond uh, to that in real time. And, um, and yeah, so that's what Twiddler is. And there's also another project called uh, Purple Rain, uh, kind of like the Prince song, and what it does is it's um, it's staffed 24/7, and they just all they do is they just monitor um, events that are happening. They decide whether they want to boost or you know dampen it down. Um, and let's see, so we've got Twiddler, we've got Purple Rain, we've also got Superroot. So Superroot plugs into Twiddler. Superroot is the thing that is actually the ranking and deranking engine. And so um, Twiddler feeds into that, Purple Rain feeds into that, and then that thing is actually the thing that you know boosts certain content or dampens it. And how many people are there that uh, basically decide whether or not uh, the content can be boosted, or what? What? Or how, how many people are there that decide what what content can be put out in the aftermath of, say, a natural disaster or a mass shooting or something like that? I'm not entirely sure. I think that the team is small. The total number of people that are working on various censorship pro uh, projects is pro uh, probably ranges in the thousands, uh, because what they're doing is that they are training these machine learning algorithms with um, by tagging data, right? So if they go through and like there's a there's a video a human reader can go through and say, oh well this is this is hate hate speech, right? And so what they're doing is that they're training the algorithms to identify certain patterns and key phrases to be hate speech, and then that is then that go, goes into Superroot, which then you know boosts it up or dampens it down. And as far as the hate speech goes, I mean, it, did you interface with the Jigsaw uh, project at all? The Google's uh, their, their I, sort of experimental. Uh... I did not, but I did have the pleasure of uh, of seeing their classification engine for YouTube videos, which was called Viacon. And Viacon does a classification based on the transliteration of the YouTube videos. So let's say you've got an influencer and he's talking about a certain topic. Well, what the AI is doing is that it's capturing all of that information and it's translating it into a text version of what the person's saying and then data mining that for keywords, and then depending on those keywords, it then classifies the video under various um, tags. And then those tags are used to figure out whether the video should be branded as brand unsafe or demonetized. And under various conditions, those videos will then lose their opportunity to, to get the monetization during their search. And this is one of the, the real dark things is that, YouTube would demonetize videos during the first six hours, and then they would be, and then the content creator would send the video up for review, and a human reviewer would see the video and they say, "Oh yeah, this actually isn't brand unsafe. We're going to turn the ads back on." But you know, 80% of the views have already been lost for monetization, and then. You know, YouTube just kept on doing this, like video after video after video was demonetized during the first like six to 12 hours. And it was really destroying these content creators, you know, revenue source. So that's how it worked. Yeah, I think that, uh, I mean, YouTube and as, like most of these social media platforms seem to be a kind of trap where they lure creators in and everybody gets on the one platform and then they, uh, they the, the, the door snaps shut and everybody's trapped in there and they no longer have their own independent uh, platforms. But I know that one document a lot of people were talking about is this blacklist of terms that has basically nine trillion different misspellings of every major mass casualty event in the last few years. Isn't that um, weird? Isn't that it's so, so, so weird? Strange. Yeah, I mean, even even words like New York City or the letter P or like 
uh, there's some really strange stuff on there. I mean, I had a whole list of them, but it's, it ended up getting too long. I did not, not even bother. But so th that's just uh, if people type that whole phrase in, it uh, it it sets off a censorship uh, script, or is it an autocorrect thing, or I mean, an autocomplete thing rather, or um, what what is that? <laughs> yeah, think think about autocomplete, but for censorship, right? So um, someone types in a query for like Stephen Paddock. And uh, the con the videos that were related to that that word were suppressed, and that's essentially what that blacklist is doing. Um, you can also find that uh, there's there's election interference in that query blacklist. Um, you can see that they blacklisted the entire term Eighth Amendment of the Constitution of Ireland. Hmm. Okay, so people yeah. searching for information related to constitutional law in Ireland were blocked from doing so. And you got to ask yourself, why does Google care? There should be a search company. Why are they like, why have they elected themselves to be um, social engineers that are figuring out what information its users should and should not have access to? It's a good question. And another thing that I think is really important is, I mean, isn't Google losing money by promoting these, uh, these quote unquote authoritative sources in YouTube? I mean, people go on YouTube because they want to see like independent uh, media creators. They don't want to see CNN and they don't want to see like the, <laughs> the, the ministry of truth. They want they want to see people like themselves. I mean, is right, Google not right. losing money on this or? They are. They are. Like, I remember back in 2016, uh, Google was talking about how they had this goal to get to 4 billion something. I can't, I can't remember if it was like watch hours or, or, or views in a day or something like that. But they said that they were trying, they had, were at 1 billion and they were trying to quadruple it to 4 billion and like by end of the next year. And then um, 2000. 16 happened and well actually um, the election happened in 2016 and uh, they pretty much just like abandoned that entire uh, mandate and so um, yeah they're losing money over it like they're, they're literally abandoning their fiduciary responsibility to maximize shareholder profit so that they can be creepy social engineers like what is going on here like I thought that the that the primary functionality of a company was to maximize shareholder value. There's even a, a Supreme Court verdict that said that that was what the company had to do. And here they are, like abandoning, abandoning it. And, you know, and then I realized that, you know, well, why don't the shareholders just force them to stop doing this? And then I go to their IPO and I realized that, oh, they've got two different classes of stock. And one class of stock the insider stock gets has like 10 times the voting rights. So even if the company, even if the, if the founders completely, you know, um, sell out most of their stock, they can still effectively run the company. And even if most of the owners are other people, those owners don't have a say in how their company is being run. Like something really like dark is going on here with their, like now it's starting to look like they were planning this from the start. Right. And when you look at their, their, their sort of their constitution, when they go IPO, they said, you know, we don't be evil and organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. You know, I have to wonder whether that whole, you know, don't be evil wasn't a message, wasn't a commitment, but was a warning to themselves, you know. And, you know, who, who was that mission statement aimed towards? Um, and so here we are, like now Google is interfering in elections globally and they're censoring keywords and every, every you know, mass casualty event that's been, um, has been rumored to be a false flag is in this YouTube query blacklist. And... You know, people searching for, well, is David Hogg a crisis actor? Well, they've got that in there as a, as a query blacklist. So they're suppressing all of this information, you know, bombing, you know, from the Las Vegas shooting attack to bombings in New York. Um, it's, it's, it's quite eye-opening. And that seems to be the most popular document 
that has been posted online. Well, it's that's what it is. It's basically very sinister. I mean, do you know how quickly after these events these uh, words get added to the blacklist? Because for such a blanket censorship to just censor the word New York City or Port Authority bus terminal, I mean, they're really it's a very, very wide-ranging crackdown. It's They really don't want any information getting out about these things. Yeah, so the question of how fast does it, uh, uh, how fast does it happen is a really good question. And my answer to that is it happens pretty immediately. I remember during the Las Vegas shooting attack, um, there was like this emergency and um, Google and YouTube, like, send a message to every single employee saying, oh my gosh, there's all this fake news that's being generated, all these conspiracy theories that's being generated by the Las Vegas shooting, and we need to you know, make sure that, that those low-quality search results um, don't make it to the general population. And so they had this like, they had this mobilization of censorship, and all these blacklists started to appear. And what I noticed is that there was like collateral damage there was websites that had nothing to do with any sort of fake news that were being added to this blacklist. And um, there's an Easter egg that's in the, the disclosure, and I'm asking your audience to go in uh, and search for my name, Nitteris, and you're going to find something that's going to blow your mind. But, but I'm not ready to disclose what that is yet um, on air because I want to give, you know, the the – the different audiences that are listening to the interviews a uh, chance to to dive in and see what it, what the collateral damage was that happened on October 2nd, 2017 during or right after the Las Vegas shooting attack. Well, that's yeah. So, uh, audience, if you're listening, please go and look that up because I know I've I've been looking through I've made it through most of these documents at least skimming them, but there's a lot to look through and I mean, yeah, everybody sort of knew that Google was sinister and evil on some level by now, I think, if you've been paying attention. But this really, I mean, this is receipts. If you want receipts, this is receipts. Um, let's see. Uh, the, the, another one of these documents that a lot of people were talking about is this blacklist of websites. Now, this is just websites being blacklisted from Google News, correct? This is not uh, websites being blacklisted from search entirely, or is it? The, there's there's a total of 11 blacklists that have been identified now. I've released two of them, and uh, Robert Epstein, who is the former psychologist or chief editor for Psychology uh, Today, he um, he disclosed that there were nine blacklists, and he wrote an in-depth article about those blacklists. And um, what's important about these blacklists is that there is collateral damage. There are websites that have nothing to do with the topic that they're censoring that are being added to these. Um, in fact, it looks like they are legitimate URLs because they contain the keywords in the URL that, um, that have to do with the fake news. But the surprising thing is that the websites, they don't have that URL. They don't have that article. Um, and sometimes they have double subdomains in the links. And so the whole website gets taken down. They have no idea. Re they have no idea why or what the reason is. And then they go to Twitter and they complain about it, and they get nowhere. They, there's no way that they can get un, you know, un, unblacklisted. And this collateral damage is the way that, you know, insiders that have knowledge of Google's internal vulnerabilities that Google refuses to fix, they're able to stuff these little like, like, I guess we call them pet projects. They they have this like list of websites, and they they stuff them in these censorship events, and then those websites go down. So, and this pattern of collateral damage you can find in other instances of Google. So, I wrote a Medium article that I posted on my Twitter account at Perpetual Maniac, um, detailing how insiders can take down could have taken down Tulsi Gabbard's. Um, ad account. And the reason why I know how this works is because I saw how insiders were able to take down uh, Jordan B. Peterson's um, account. And the way that they're able to do this is that they, let's say that there's, you know, an ad, a target address. So let's say Jordan Peterson, and then someone takes his address and creates a spam account that differs by one letter. 
right? So maybe they spell Jordan with two N's. And they, they repeat this process until there's a spam network, a bot network of, of, of similar spam accounts to the original target account. Now they start pushing spam out to every, to a bunch of other uh, accounts. Well, the Google AI will flag that as suspicious activity and bring down the whole spam network, but they'll also bring down the target email address. And this is the thing that's really strange. And so when the person's like, why did my account get suspended? You know, especially if they're an influencer. And Google will respond, well, it seems like your account had suspicious activity, right? And now the person, you know, they can't talk to a human. They have no idea what's happening. And their account just goes down. They lost everything inside of it, you know. And Jordan Peterson was able to get his account back because there was a, network of people complaining to, to Google like hey this guy's account has been taken down and so you know there's a human intervention they go oh wow it looks like someone's making a bunch of accounts but that information never makes it back to the public so the public never knows that there's this vulnerability and the cycle just continues on and on and on and on and on and Google refuses to fix it and the question I have is why doesn't Google want to fix this and you know, that gets into conspiracies about what's really going on with the company. But I've noticed that this pattern of collateral damage exists across several different platforms and several different modalities. Yeah, I was I was just about to get into that, actually. I mean, well, Facebook talks about its coordinated inauthentic behavior, which it's used to deplatform de hundreds of political pages in the run up to elections. And Wikipedia also does the same thing. I mean, the Wikipedia smear is famous for they say, oh, it's not us smearing this person it's these editors oh if you know you, you want to anybody can edit yeah you just try to edit a political page about a, an important event that's going on now it's impossible it's impossible so, they I mean, shut they closed the gates they shut it off now you can't you can't challenge the wikipedia article and now they're, they're rewriting all the articles um in a really like creepy or willian sense they're they're rewriting history and now you get now, effectively, Wikipedia is a laundering for slander, you know, and so um, the, Google calls it vandalism. Oh, Wikipedia has been vandalized, right? And it's kind of ridiculous because that vandalism gets ingested by its AI algorithms and then it starts – it starts leaking out into, you know, the larger Google uh, search engine. So I remember there was a time when – you could search for California Republican and Google would return back a, a bunch of structured results. And one of the results was, you know, the ideology and it listed it as like Nazi. It's like they have a Nazi yep, ideology. I remember that. And, and people are like, oh, how can this happen? And I on the inside saw that it was because they were ingesting the data from Wikipedia under the ideology tag and someone knew that they could put Nazism under that ideology tag and would go all the way, they have right access all the way to the search engine. And so what did Google did? They're like, oh, well, let's just, you know, not take in, you know, the, the ideology tag from Wikipedia anymore. Hmm. And, and that's, that's how it works. Yeah, putting a Band-Aid on a gaping bullet wound. I mean, how closely do Google and Wikipedia work as far as, like, the Google takes content for knowledge boxes and, and uh, YouTube takes content for these conspiracy theory boxes that it puts under videos about 9-11 and whatnot? Like, how, how closely do the two uh, websites coordinate, do you know? Um, from a couple of data points, uh, it appears to me that they do it quite closely. Um, there was, uh, there was one weird Google search um, uh, weirdness that people are familiar with uh, in the conspiracy circles, and that's if you, you go into Google and you type in um, American scientists or American oh, inventors, right? So you know, up to 1960, 90% of America was white. So you would expect that since most of the history has had most of American history has been predominantly white, that most of the results would be predominantly white as well for, you know, who our American scientists have been, just by the fact that they dominate in sheer numbers. Now, Google's results return, you know, when you search for that term American scientist, it returns a list predominantly uh, focused on African Americans. And same for, you know, so that, that exists for American scientists and that exists for American inventors. And so I started to dig in 
like, well, why, why is it, why, why is this the case? And it turns out it's Wikipedia. Oh, okay. How, how is, how is Wikipedia doing that? Um, I don't have it up in front of me, but, uh, they've listed American, American, um, African American, you know, so, so, you know, there's this assumption that African American are always, you know, black people, which is really ridiculous because I've got a really good friend from South Africa and she's white. But so they've listed these people under African Americans. And so what happens is that when someone types in American scientist, American scientists or American inventors, what it's doing is, is it's grabbing from that, it's keyword matching to the list African Americans and putting that, that, that information out there. And so it's over reporting um, uh, for African Americans. Now, Okay, so that's a mistake, and if Google was to be made aware of this mistake, they would fix it, right? Well, no, that's not what happens. You know, there's an email, there's an email thread that I included in the disclosure of yeah, someone. Cool. You saw that, and someone's complaining, "Hey, like this is this is giving us really bad press. You know, can we fix this?" And the response to that is, "Hey, you know, we've got this program called ProFair. We're trying to bring fairness to the to the internet, and ProFair is part of ML fairness. And they said this is part of ProFair, so you know, this is just collateral damage. And they didn't fix it at all. And this is the problem: is that not only are they are these results getting poisoned, but when this poisoning has been brought to the attention of Google, they're willingly turning a blind eye, and they're not trying to fix it. And once you take all these data points together, put them together and connect the dots, you, you start getting the sinister picture of a company that is trying to, you know, institute an overthrow of the American system for some global communist, you know, conspiracy. And I hate to say the word conspiracy, but if you're going to apply Occam's razor to all of this, it's pretty clear that the same people that feed narratives into the New York Times are the same people that are feeding narratives into, into Google. You know, oh, the the only other the only other thing you conclude is that it's just it's just a total coincidence that all this stuff happens uh, at the same time, you know. And so I I don't believe that. I believe in logic and reason. And it's clear after watching this company for three years under a microscope that they're engaged in some sort of you know, nefarious conspiracy that you know is being decided above the uh, CEO level. And uh, yeah, about the, the, the diversity versus the purpose of the search engine, there was one document that said that, oh, it would be a bad thing if, if Google, if the search results that were returned were the most popular search results. Now, wasn't that the whole point of Google to begin with? I mean, right. back when it first started, I mean, I mean, I think really this came under weird. the definition of algorithmic unfairness. They're trying to like figure out yeah. like what would be like unfair. Exactly. And what they said is that I think they used the example of like a CEO. So, you know, if someone searched for CEO and the results were that were returned were mostly male, they said that even if this reflected objective reality, it could still be classified as algorithmic unfairness and that we should intervene via product intervention. So there you hmm. go. Like reality is unfair. Objective reality is unfair and they're going to redefine it because they think that, you know, we can be programmed and that and that by fixing people that they're going to create a better and more equitable and just society. That's their words, not mine. Yep, and they speak quite openly about programming people. I mean, that's uh, some of it they say, okay, we don't want to put this in print, but some of it they say, well, yeah, we program, uh, this is how neural networks work, and we have to take advantage of this. And the exact quote that I was looking for is, suppose Google favors pages most linked to clicked on. That's the whole point of Google. I mean, that's when it first started. That was the whole point of Google. Right. I mean, yeah, I have a bunch of details that I guess we don't have time to if you have to go in 15 minutes, but that there's a bunch of other stuff that I want to get to. So um, basically, this e this equality of opportunity, like that, that they've they've um, they've given up on making search their focus, and now it's making diversity their focus again. Like this is this has shouldn't, the shareholders would seem to have a problem with this. Like they put all of their energy, they put all their money into picking through the coffee beans, that weird document that. That, uh, so weird. People so different coffee, types beans of coffee beans. Is so weird. It's just, it's like wow. And they even say in the document, 
hey, don't save this because this could be really damaging to us later on. Yeah, it's like they don't want it to get out. And I was wondering, like, I mean, it seems like Google's kind of a cult. They have their own language. They have their they have very secretive uh, with the, all of the layers and layers of non-disclosure agreements. Like, now if, if they're a cult, is there a holy text? I heard there was a woman uh, giving a speech about algorithmic unfairness, and she mentioned a book uh, about uh, something about moral psychology, Jonathan Haidt, or something like that. Is there like a, a holy text of Google or is it just a, a religion? Yeah, well, they've, they've had an indoctrination program for a while. Um, and what they did is they had all the employees um, register for this class called Implicit Association Test. And this AIT test uh, was developed at Stanford and it was later outed as pseudoscience by the Wall Street Journal. But what it did is it was a challenge response test. So they give you, they, they, they flash things on a screen and then you have to like click a certain button. Um, and uh, what that test does is it measures how internally racist the, um, the, 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 the employee is. And then they give you a score and they say, well, we're not gonna send this score to your manager, so it's okay. And, um, and my, my understanding about that is that they were kind of priming the employees to think of themselves as inherently racist and biased. And then um, the solution to that was that they were, is that Google would introduce this, um, this machine learning fairness to get rid of all the different biases. But here's the problem, is that if you have the whole set of human biases, right, it forms this circle. Uh, let's say there's like 100, and that's about a close number but let's say there's 100 identified human biases. What, what Google did is they only chose 13 of those. And this is a problem because that means that if they only define the set of biases as this subset, then anything that is not part of that subset is by definition not something that they're solving fairness for, which means that all of those other biases are now attack vectors that you can use to inter to inject bias into the machine learning algorithms. So, you know, it's it's you know, when there's like this huge castle that's built on a foundation, you know, and there's like walls and there's ramparts and you know, there's a lot of people like manning it. People are like, "Oh, how do we how do we, you know, break the walls down, you know?" And the that's the wrong point of attack when something is fundamentally flawed it's it's flawed right at the foundation and so you can just skip the walls you can skip the windows you can skip all the people of you know presumed credibility that defend it you just go right to the foundation and the papers that i've disclosed show the weakness and they show the bias and they show that they are deliberately classifying a hand-picked selection of biases they're going that they're going to solve for and they're going to say that all the other biases they aren't. And that's the weakness of this is that, you know, this shouldn't be called you know, machine learning fairness. This should be called machine learning unfairness. Yes, selective unfairness. Right, because the output is unfair. Like you go to, you know, the search engine and you search for, um, you know, men can, and it's auto-completing for men can have babies, men can have periods as its top results, that's not rational, that's not fair, that's that's a clown world, and it needs to be called out as a clown world. And it doesn't just extend to cultural events, it also goes on into the political spectrum. So if you go, you know, Trump body, you know, it's, it's gonna autocomplete to body count, and then you go to Hillary Clinton body, you know, you put in C, it's, it, it's not gonna give you any search prediction. And there's been so many people that have died around Hillary Clinton. And a lot of people may still think it's a conspiracy, but I think most of the people have woken up at this point. There are so many people that have died. I think it's like 45 to 60 people have died around Hillary Clinton under very mysterious, you know, causes. And I think one guy was, you know, he, he died with two gunshot wounds to the back of the head. And uh, the police Gary declared Webb? it. Maybe, and the police declared that it was a suicide. <laughs> and, yeah, the, nobody has 45 dead friends. That's the that's how I always put it. Yeah, I mean, so but, uh, um, yeah, that's that's the um, 
yeah, that's that's what they consider algorithmic fairness. So yeah, I, I call I call BS on that. And that's just why I disclosed is because you know Google's entire you know um, operating uh, procedures to dox America Americans and sell it to you know ad exchanges, and I just turned the tables on them. You know, Patriots on the inside doxing Google, and so that's our disclosure. And that was one of the things I wanted to ask about, like, can they be stopped or are they too closely integrated with the government? Because Google basically is the CIA at this point. They they host all their servers and stuff and they, they're so closely integrated with the Pentagon, although they say that they're not. Um, I mean, you work with Google Earth, you know, that Google Earth started as a CIA project called Keyhole. So, right. I mean, it, funded how, by can they be stopped? Yep. Yep. Um, can they be stopped? I think that they will be stopped. Um, the weak point of evil is that you just have to um, shine a spotlight on it. And once everyone sees the, the absolute circus that exists, then it kind of collapses on its own. And so I think that the first step of this, of defeating Google, is to um, disclose what they're doing. You know, and you see, you know, Trump uh, directing a lawsuit just this morning to to Google for um, uh, its 2016 election uh, meddling. And that's that's a first step is acknowledging and getting all that information out there and getting court cases um, um, getting court cases to to acknowledge and rule that yes, in fact they did. the evidence is overwhelming. So that's like the first step. What comes after that is going to be up to the think tanks. It's going to be up to the industry. Um, I think that this is a watershed moment. I think that there's a real coming together of left and right. And what we're noticing is that Google is censoring both of us. Yes. And the thing is, is that this is a bipartisan moment for us to figure out what we're going to do about that. And um, I think that if there's this much illegal activity that Google has been involved in, then what else are they involved in? And I think that what's going to happen is that as this gets investigated and all of these illicit activities come to the light, that Google is essentially going to collapse by the weight of its own illegal activity. I mean, I, I would like to see Google collapse under the weight of its own evil and of its own uh, misdeeds, but I don't know. I mean, it seems like they basically have us all by the throat and uh, I don't know. I mean, it, it's it's pretty scary. Um I mean, how, how, do, how do we protect ourselves from Google basically uh, selling, selling our, our deepest secrets if we do, if we step out of line? Like, I mean, you have had your own uh, smear job with the Daily Beast uh, coming out and saying all this stuff about you, getting you basically blacklisted from mainstream, even more enlightened networks like the one that I work for um, don't want to go near you because of that uh, smear job. So, I mean, that's happens to basically anybody who steps out of line how do we protect ourselves from that right so um you know this is something i've been giving a lot of thought because i'm kind of like on the run from google right now and i've realized that everything that i do every email that i send um half the phones that i text message are google products and therefore they have access to that data firsthand and so what I've been doing is I've been engaging in a Google detox where I stop using their products. I stop using um, Google search and I start using start page and DuckDuckGo. Um, and I've changed my browsers. I've deleted Chrome and I've switched to the Brave browser and Firefox. Um, although Firefox seems to be heading down the same road that Google yeah, is. Firefox um, is not good and the, the Tor browser. Um, I still use Twitter because it seems to be uh, not going down the same clown uh, road that, that Google is going down. But, you know, I, and then for email, I've switched from Gmail to ProtonMail. And actually, ProtonMail seems to be a much better experience than the Gmail is. Um, like, and, what, and what else, right? Like, I, a lot of the content is still hosted on YouTube, but there seems to be a mobilization of people as they're moving to BitChute and Minds and other, you know, video services. And so right now what I see is that people are waking up, they're realizing what the situation is, and they're engaging in a Google detox strategy. And, um, and actually having gone through this, I thought it was going to be really bad, but it turns out it's actually really good. Um, 
it, and it, it feels good to give my support to people that respect user privacy rather than violate it. Yeah, okay. Um, other thing is uh, Google, they've said that uh, having multiple search results is basically a bug. They want to have one search result. Basically, that's where this voice activated computing is going towards. And that's where I see it converging with Wikipedia because the first Google search result is usually Wikipedia. Um, how far away would you say that that is, that uh, basically we are looking at one search result and, and it's brought to you by Google and then it's Wikipedia? At this point, that timeline is no longer possible. I, I can't see that that it can exist in any foreseeable future. There's just too many people that are awake right now. And um, so, yeah, I don't think there's just going to be one result. I think they wanted to put one result. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's not going to happen anymore. Uh, because if it does, we're just going to go use a different search engine. I hope, I hope you're right. I hope there are enough people who actually are awake enough to realize uh, how evil this stuff is that's breathing down our neck and we hear about these like these google assistants and these amazon alexas that are spying on us everything and we're told that everybody's got one but i per personally don't know anybody who has these things who would invite them into their homes and i think that a lot of this is this projection that this is normal that this is nobody cares about privacy anymore but in reality people actually do and nobody wants to have this, uh, I mean, basically the, the merger of corporate and state is called fascism. I mean, people hold up Trump as being the epitome of fascism, but it's, that's totally a distraction. Trump is meaningless in the grand scheme of things. It's corporations and government. To... All right, well, actually there was one other thing I did want to ask that would be a nice What's end that? to finish on, but uh, this this whole, uh, the censorship thing is being aided and abetted by these groups that claim to be against hate speech and claim to be for uh, marginalized groups, groups like the ADL, groups like the SPLC. Um, how closely does Google interface with those? Like, have they got uh, people in, in there or is it just they happen to be, because I know that the ADL was for a while working on one of these algorithms to basically detect quote unquote hate before it actually is put out there, basically stopping stopping messages before they're posted, that sort of thing. Um, how closely is Google involved with that, with this jigsaw um, perspective API, stuff like that? Um, pretty close, you know, Google had big contracts with the ADL and the SLPC to police their content. Um, they jettisoned uh, those people recently, um, but they've had their hands in a lot of Google's um, machine learning fairness algorithms. And it's really sad because the ADL says they're anti-defamation league, but in hmm. fact, they, they operate as a defamation organization. And um, the, South, the Southern Law Poverty Center does the same thing. They they don't prevent hate. They engage in it by listing. I mean, the SLPC lists Christian identity as a hate organization, you know. And so you, you see how creepy this is. Like if, if the phrase Christian identity is, you know, a hate phrase, then because some random group that was probably made by the deep state you know, called themselves that. Now, all of a sudden, if someone goes on Twitter or, you know, web page and say, I identify as Christian, well, that's so close to, to that that they can now be flagged. And so um, these groups have been involved with a lot of Google services. Um, they were involved in Jigsaw. I don't know the specifics of that because I didn't work on that project, but um, they've been dropped and I'm really happy. As, as far as I know, they've They've both been dropped from Google, and that's that's a step in the right direction. But but we can't stop there. And uh, just the Wikipedia thing with uh, Wikipedia can determine what is and is not a reliable source. Does Google rely on Wikipedia for its uh, ratings of news organizations, or how do they get? Because I saw like numbered um, like the Wall Street Journal was up at the top, and uh, Infowars was at the bottom, and then everybody else was somewhere in between with numbers. Where do they get those numbers? I mean, it's so disgusting that the that the Washington Post is considered a credible it's news really, organization at this mm, point, you know. Yeah. And and it's 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 funny just to go off on a small tangent. Um, I was told by a prominent left wing influencer that James O'Keefe was not credible, and it's just like he's he's never ha ever had to retract a story, you know. Uh, and to think that James O'Keefe and Project Veritas are not considered by the influential left as credible, but the New York Times is, is mind boggling. So I don't think that they have to even go to Wikipedia. I, my, my understanding is that their, their rank of credibility is done internally. 
Um, and that uh, what they started to realize is that that is a liability. So they need, they've been farming it out to third parties like the ADL and SLPC. So, but don't quote me on that. That's just a theory. So, okay. Is there anything in particular that you really want to get out there that uh, you haven't yet said, or that you, that you um, think that yeah. people really need to know? Yeah. So, um, I encourage your audience to come and look me up on Twitter as uh, Perpetual Maniac. Um, your retweets are what's keeping me alive. Um, there's a lot of whistleblowers that have come out and said, you know, hey, the lifespan of a whistleblower is pretty short. So um, the only way you can survive is to stay in the spotlight. And if I stay in the spotlight, then I'm going to be fine. If I go into the shadows, then um, uh, I become vulnerable. So, you know, for the audience, like I am on a mission of truth and justice, and I'm exposing Google, and I ask that they come and help me um, spread the message and spread the truth. And because we're going to take this beast down, we're going to, we're, we're, I'm fighting dragons, and um, and they're weak right now, and there's other titans that are lining up to to take them down with me. And so I ask your audience to help join the fight, and together we can make a difference in a safer America. Okay, yes, um, I got to run to my right. to another interview, but it's been an absolute pleasure to great be talking on the show. Yeah. All right, yeah. Helen, thank you very much. Thank you. Have a great day. All right, bye.